Erin Lang is going to come up now. And if all of the panelists would come up, we're going to do a question and answer panel. If I can get some of the virus focus group members to collect index cards with questions around from the tables. Hopefully some of you guys have written some questions down. We all know that Aaron, we all know that Aaron has a lot of good questions on his own, but we want to hear from everybody too. Um, so, and we're also inviting Chris Storm up as a grower. Chris was one of the first people to really start doing virus management, Chris and Charlie and Aaron. And um, he's got a lot of practical advice, not only just in Lodi, but also in um, other coasts. And people in Washington State that talk to me about viruses, they say, Stephanie, we really started testing for viruses um, in nursery material and other material because Chris Storm told us to. So he knows what he's talking about. So without further ado, I am going to pass, the, pass it over to Aaron um, for our Q&A panel. But please just please smile so I can take your photo. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm here just to uh, facilitate your questions, and I really encourage you while we have this panel of experts here today to please you know, ask away, because this is our opportunity. I'm going to start with a few questions that I have here in my hand, and then I think other folks are going to bring theirs up, and I'll try not to repeat uh, too many. Um, so this is for uh, Dr. Peterson. After roguing, how soon do you replant, and is there a point where you would no longer replant that vine? That's a more difficult question than, than it sounds. Um, Replanting in young vineyards is, is very successful. So um, in those instances, um, most of our growers will actually replant immediately. Um, a small percentage of those plants do become infected again, but it's a relatively small percentage. Do you think that infection comes from vine leaf bug? Uh, being harbored in the roots below the system that came from the previously roped vine, or do you believe it's from the neighboring vines coming in? We, we don't know, but it's, but it's potentially both of those. Um, in, a, in an older vineyard, it becomes really, really difficult to replant. So um, the idea is really, when you do start a new vineyard, try to get the, 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 the infected vines out as quickly as possible. That allows you to do a replant as well. The older your vineyard gets, the more difficult it becomes. Great, thank you very much. Um, you're going to be on the spot again here, but I encourage if any other panel member here has something to add to the questions, please jump in. But uh, another one for Dr. Peterson here. Um, when can you uh, effectively see symptoms and rogue in a newly planted vineyard? I think Dr. Stamp may have answered that, saying that he saw some infection even at the nursery level. Um, but is, are they apparent, these symptoms, at year one for, uh, for uh, the main varieties, Cab, Merlot, um, Chardonnay? Um, if, if, if the infection is due to planting material, then there's a difference in whether you will see it in the first season, whether it was through the rootstock that was infected or through the sign that was infected. So there's already a difference. Um, and then Kent actually showed some nice data around when a meat bug um, actually infects it. Um, you showed a, a more than a year later. Yeah. yeah, so you can have infections come on later. Um, we did work with Monica Cooper and John in Napa trying to find out how you pull these roots out, what you can do. And I was visiting in uh, New Zealand as well where they showed live millibugs two years after a vine was pulled out, still living on the ground. The issue is that it's very difficult to use anything to kill the roots. So we tried um, putting Roundup on it. We tried painting it, shooting it, every different type of method to kill those roots. Mike McHenry has tried fumigation. It's just really hard to get anything effective more than about a foot, uh, foot and a half down below the soil. And we know if you've got ants, and we know you do have ants, that uh, the ants will take the millibugs to where the food is, um, and that's on the roots left in the ground. And they also think that it's harder here to go for two years fallow than it might be in South Africa. Just one additional comment on the timing of symptom development and when they become apparent. And in your replants, uh, my take is usually if you see leaf or symptoms in year one, the first leaf, 
this highly likely the cyan buds that were infected. It's highly unlikely that the infection results from minibug transmission. Um, however, if it takes longer, if it takes the second, third, or fourth leaf, then you have two options. Either you're dealing with minibug transmission or the source of the infection is the rootstock. Because it takes tremendous time for the virus to translocate from a rootstock into the cyan. Just something to keep in mind. Okay, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, agree that we have seen uh, uh, leaf roll and red blot contaminated vines in the nursery row on several occasions within about, you know, the, the, the vines in the nursery row are generally planted in May or June, and so we've symptom, seen symptoms in October, November, which again would indicate, as uh, Mark saying, there would be a cyan contamination versus a, a rootstock contamination. Okay, this question is a, a practical one about uh, removing disease material from the vineyard. It's a two-part question. Uh, one, um, during the fallow period or before the roving, is it effective to use glyphosate or another systemic herbicide to try to kill roots uh, and to kill it versus physically removing the roots? Uh, and two, once you've removed that infected material, is chipping disease material sufficient to remove the inoculum uh, of leaf roll and red blotch or is burning necessary? Um, the first part is we, we uh, way back, we did recommend herbicides as a, as a, as a means of trying to kill the, the vine, but we couldn't find a single herbicide that actually kills it all the way down to the roots, exactly what Ken said now. Um, so we, we no longer actually use herbicides to do that. Remember, when you're talking about a virus, it needs a living plant material, it doesn't create spores. So, in fact, uh, burning or chipping it is not that important from the virus perspective. Okay, great, thank you. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, are there any plants, hedgerows, so on and so forth, that a grower can use as a border around a newly planted block to prevent the spread of vectors possibly coming from neighbors? So they actually try this to some extent in New Zealand because in New Zealand they've got smaller blocks typically and they've got these wonderful hedges. They go up about 20 feet. The idea is that the millibug will be blown by the wind. If it's a wall, like one of these walls, what happens is that the wind goes up and over and just carries the millibug up and over and actually pulls it back uh, into the vine on the other side. So the idea with the hedgerows is that the wind would blow through it, the millibugs would land on a plant that they don't survive on, and they wouldn't they try to feed and eventually die. Um, I've not seen data on how effective that is. What Vaughn uh, Bell had in that area is he put up cards in between infected and uninfected vineyards and was finding a tremendous number of crawlers being blown by the wind to the level of 100 per little yellow sticky card per week. So the hedgerow might be effective, but again, it's one more thing for growers here to plant, to maintain, to worry about, um, whereas insecticide application, something like that might be easier. In terms of cover cropping within the vineyard, this is something we've gone back and forth on because for years we tested and looked at cover crops in their role to increase beneficial insects. And we know that especially the obscure millibug uh, can survive on many of the covers and weeds that you put into the vineyard. The vine millibug can feed on it and survive. I don't think it can reproduce on all of them, but it gives them a kind of a bridge for survival. So no real answer there. Are there any particular cover crop species that we should be avoiding, uh, maybe in the case of alfalfa leafhopper, um, so should we be moving away from broad, broad leaps and more towards grasses in order to reduce the habitat for certain vectors like so, alfalfa leafhopper, which doesn't prefer vines necessarily? Yeah, so um, we had this discussion just uh, an hour ago. I'm still not convinced that it's easy to control Tika to reduce the spread of red blotch. If it's in your area, there's a lot of it. Uh, we definitely are looking right now at the legumes in the row middles and trying to manipulate those numbers to control it. Um, so you've got a question of having nothing in the vine rows, having it bare soil, 
and that probably will reduce the amount of tikka going through. I'm, I'm sorry, tikka? I three-cornered alfalfa. Thank you. Offer. Sorry. <laughs> so um, I, I can't really give a recommendation yet on the use of trap crops for control of this pest, but it's something Houston Wilson at Riverside and I are looking at. Frank Salem's lab is looking as well. I'm going to pass this on to Mark. Because? Because. <laughs> because is the answer. Um, the, the question is still pending, actually, but I can share with you that the heavily infested vineyard sites uh, in Napa County, uh, we monitored uh, cover crops, particularly legumes, on which the hopper thrives and can reproduce to see whether they carry the virus. That would have indicated eventually a connection between the cover crops, legumes serving as preferred host for the hopper and bridging it with the, the infected vines uh, in terms of their role in the epidemiology of the disease. And we tested over 500 uh, legume samples over the years and a few other plant species from these heavily infected red blotch, vineyard blocks, and we have yet to find a single sample that tests positive for red blotch. So in other words, right now, if you ask me what my recommendation is, continue doing what you're doing in terms of cover crops. This means that maybe next week or in a month <coughs> down the road, once our knowledge evolves, we might have to change our recommendations. But as of today, there is nothing to, wor to be worried about cover crops being actively involved in the epidemiology of red blotch. Again, bottom line, get rid of the inoculum. All right, in case you didn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> this is an interesting one, especially from a grower's perspective or a nurseryman. Um, what is the acceptable standard for leaf roll three or red blotch virus infection in commercial nursery stock? We all know that nurseries can't guarantee that they're delivering clean stock. Is there a standard or an acceptable percentage that's allowable when you're purchasing commercial nursery stock? Um, well, for me, I don't think there is. I mean, we, we, we work very hard to make sure that the clients that work with us get vines that don't have virus, like Red, red Blotch Leaf Roll 3 and the whole panel. We test for the whole panel of viruses. We have different, different testing panels for um, Protocol 2010 materials, non-certified and certified. But for me, from my perspective, I don't want my clients to get any virus. And so there is a way of doing this. If you, ha if you have a, a production program where you test all your increased block vines and uh, you maintain them in a clean environment and you have your foundation plant materials maybe in a clean environment or away from any other uh, commercial vineyards, I think it's quite possible to do that. Um, in terms of acceptable standards, if it's a red variety, well, maybe you can rogue it out fairly easily. But if it's a white variety, you know, I think it's going to be very lucky that you'll see it in the first two or three years, and by that time it could be transmitted. So I think we need to hold the nurseries to a very high standard. They need to be, be providing us with vines and figure out how to do it, provide us with vines that don't have virus. And I know it's doable because we do it frequently for our clients. It's just a question of, you know, can the nurseries put the emphasis, can the nursery put the, um, the resources into that? And again, if we're talking about a plant that costs $3.50, it's basically nothing, you know, I think. I mean, okay, it's a cup of coffee versus $3.50. What if the plant was $7? What if we had a plant that was $7? What would that give us in terms of uh, a better feeling for whether or not it was a, a virus test negative vine? Yeah. A seven dollar vine would give me a heart attack. Um, <laughs> I agree with most of what you said, but for some of us who have clients or bankers that require revenue after a certain amount of time after you've pulled a vineyard, you need to get a vine in the ground. So it kind of comes down to the relationship you have with your nursery. Make sure that you have a relationship with your nursery and it's not just a phone call, order the vines and that's it. But if you do have something that, you know, a low level of testing positive in the samples you've received or once the vine is planted, that relationship is going to really turn out. You're going to want to talk about how many, what percentage of replants they're going to provide and for how long. Um, are they going to participate in the sampling with you? Are they going to share the cost of that kind of stuff? So each nursery is an individual company. Each grower is an individual grower. You can set up your own relationship. 
Um, but I think we have to accept for large plantings that perfection is not entirely possible. Uh, as much that that's just the reality of the state of our industry. So knowing that, build into your budgets a certain percentage of replants for the for the first ten years. Two percent of re, you know two percent of your budget or two percent of the vines replanting, no matter what, or whatever it is. But um, practically speaking, and I don't want to uh, negate anything you said here in Lodi. I, I just don't think we can say 100% is expected. Okay, Mark. Mark, thank you. <laughs> um, you're asking what would be a good number in terms of the incidence. So just to make sure and consistent with my message, the number I recommend is zero. No tolerance whatsoever. But acknowledging all the comments that have been made, this is a lofty goal, right? But we should shoot for that goal, goal, although it's a lofty one as we speak. And I know that everyone is doing its due diligence to try to reach that goal. Will it happen tomorrow? Will it happen next week? Will it happen in a year? I do not know. But if we work collectively towards achieving that goal, I think we'll be all better off and the industry collectively will be better off. Now, what I'd like to say now is those who will drive that mechanism, that program to reach the zero tolerance is each of you in this room. You are the drivers of the program. If you are not asking for extensively virus tested material, you will not get it. You are the drivers. You are the ones who will help all of us reach that goal. Thank you. Are there for the growers of the panel and those who have experience in the growing of uh, vineyards with a high incidence of infection. I'm talking where roving is not possible but not economically feasible to remove the vineyard. Are there any good strategies out there to reduce the negative effects of leaf rule three, i.e. production and phenolics, color, maturity? Is there lots of people out there selling snake oil to try to get us to buy, saying it's going to help mature that crop even with a leaf roll infection. Is there any practical experience that says that something out there works? A bulldozer. That's the only <laughs> thing I've been able to figure out. I'm, I'm serious. We did a very robust study, replicated trial with many different um, sprayable formulations, fertilizer, and nothing works. Even dropping the tonnage down to four tons to the acre, not economically viable here, didn't work. So what I'll add to that is that this came up in uh, Sonoma because there were some old uh, Zinfandels that were just not going to come out and the grower had close to 100% infectivity and my suggestion was, well, that's the block where you should be worried about millibugs. That's the block you should be treating because every millibug leaving that block is infected. Mm -hmm. um, so don't give up on the millibug control. If you're planting something clean next to it, worry about the block that's 100% infected with the virus. Yeah, I, I support that fully. So, so basically, just to add up, uh, the, the message is based on the fact that a vine that is virus infected, whether leaf roll or red blotch or whatever you name it, is a stressed vine by definition, right? <coughs> so the more you do in order to mitigate the effect of leaf roll, in favor of the vine and favoring the growth of the vine, the better off the vine will be able to defend itself against the virus infection. And we have to keep in mind that there is no uh, silver bullet out there because the severity of any virus symptom with a leaf or a red blotch and any other depends on the clone that you choose on top of a rootstock in a given environment in a vineyard managed in a certain way. So something might be working to mitigate the, infect, the, the impact of leaf rot in a one vineyard by not be translatable into similar positive results in another vineyard. But bottom line, try to boost the growth and the vigor of the vines so that it has a chance to verify the virus infection. Thank you. I, was gonna, I, I just want to s s 
say one other thing, and I think as Ger Gerhard mentioned in his presentation, I think it's very good if you can communicate with your neighbours so that you could potentially have a, a small area or a local area of replanting just as you did in the, um, where was that? Fairhill, yeah. Yeah, yes, that exactly. <laughs> Fairhill, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's amazing how many times we see the new blocks getting planted, new clean blocks getting planted, say in Rutherford or Oakville, and they're completely surrounded by, by dirty vineyards. So in terms of strategies, that's a really good strategy. You know, Monica Cooper's working on it and various other people are, but it really is a, it's a great strategy if you can do it. To coordinate removal with your neighbours. Here's um, a question. What's that? There's so many more. <laughs> All right. Uh, you too. Okay. <laughs> Could you please comment on the accuracy of lethal three tests, given that it's highly variant? And uh, some of you mentioned that uh, lethal three was very hard to detect in rootstock. So in the rootstock, is it just not showing visually? But can you see it in a lab test? Can you talk about the accuracy of the world testing? Um, on scions, um, using ELISA. Um, ELISA, the, 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 the kick we have in South Africa, which, which we produced, um, picks up all the variants that are known at this stage. So ELISA is quite reliable, but its sensitivity is not as, as good as another technique, PCR. PCR is uh, variable in, in what it can do. It depends on how you design the, the tech, technique. It can pick up individual strains or, or much wider. Um, but it's, and it's more sensitive. Um, so on cyan material, I've, I'm not too concerned. Between ELISA and PCR, we've got it pretty much covered. Rootstocks are another ballgame. Um, we're not quite sure what's happening in rootstocks. Uh, we initiated the studies on rootstocks because we, when we were testing them for, with ELISA, we'd be getting very low absorbance values. When we tested them with PCRs, it would be variable. So that's where we started doing the experiments, where we went to a, a vine that we knew was absolutely, definitely leaf roll infected, but actually tested the rootstocks there. And, and in about two thirds of the instances, we couldn't find type three down there, not even with PCR. Um, and we're actually wondering if, there, if, if, if what we call, say, Richter 99, if that's actually a homogeneous cultivar and whether there aren't possibly genetic variations in there, some of which are susceptible and some of which are pretty well immune. Thank you. Um, last question, although there are so many good ones here. Um, how long does it take for the virus to move through a grapevine from the time of infection? Uh, is cane pruning a better method than cordon pruning from uh, keeping the virus from spreading throughout the vine? Any, any comments there? Thank you, my friends up here. <laughs> I knew they were my friends, right? <laughs> Actually, there is no easy answer to this one. It's an excellent question. And I don't think there has been, at least I'm not aware of any scientific uh, sound experiment that has been designed and actually implemented to address this question. Intuitively, as a var virologist with my little experience, I would say it doesn't make any bit of a difference. Uh, regardless of how you prune it, the virus will find its way uh, throughout the whole vine. It might take more time. Uh, it again, it will depend on, as I just mentioned, on the particular clone of a sign of your choice onto a rootstock in a given <coughs> environment. Um, but I don't think that the end effect will differ how the vine is, is pruned and maintained. Great, thank you. Stephanie? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I'm oh, sorry, Stephanie. Um, we, we form a lot of cane pruned almost 90% of our vineyards in the north coast are cane pruned and uh, they're just as susceptible it moves just as fast through those as it does in cordon pruned or machine pruned uh, vineyards. All right so I know that there are more questions but we do have plenty of time all of these guys will be around until about 1:15, so you can interact with them they're all agreeing to stay through there um, and and uh, Dr. Maher Alrawana wanted to mention something um, from FPS really quickly to the audience too. So if you'll run up here, Maher, but let's give a round of applause for our great panel.
Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Maher Rawahni. I'm the lab director at FPS. And I would like just to clarify a couple of points that, uh, you know, we learned a lot. And I will uh, second what uh, Mark said and David was saying, that it's all our job to work together to uh, ensure that you get the best and the cleanest plant material. Uh, Dr. Stamp presented uh, uh, the table out of the uh, FPS newsletter where it shows the testing and just want to clarify that FPS is not the source of an infected plant material. What we did, you know, like other, we, if we plant material out in, in nature, we will plant material is get infected. What FPS is doing is to ensure that we test each and every plant uh, before we ship it. And if you noticed, just please uh, visit the FPS website to learn more about what, what we are doing uh, to ensure that we give you the best and the cleanest plants material with testing and testing and testing. And 2018, 2017, FPS adopted a test to order policy because we have zero tolerance for any virus infecting. And the, the recent incident of Russell Ranch infection of red plage, we had history of testing between 2013 when we established the vineyard until 2017 when we start seeing some infection, which we believe it comes with a vector. So I just want to clarify this. Still, we have the source of the cleanest plant material and each and every vine in both foundation vineyards, Rasser Ranch and the classic foundation is tested annually now for leaf roll three and red blotch. Thanks for the opportunity for responding. Yeah, thank you. So I think you can tell that everyone in this room is pretty passionately involved in doing their part to give us, um, to reduce vectors of viruses and to reduce virus inoculum. And um, if you want to meet the director of Foundation Plant Services, Deborah Galino is with us today. She actually rearranged her schedule. She has some visitors and she rearranged things to be with your, be here with us today. And so did several other people and I'm sure you did too. So take home messages. We have to take some action. We have to do it together. I think we all hit home the message that it's important to rogue. We'll be learning about that more. We'll hopefully create some more handouts and outreach materials on that. Now it's time to interact with vendors, go to lunch, and if you're invited to one of the afternoon sessions, come see me, I'll give you more information. Thank you all very much, let's do this. One of the most uh, impressive things from this morning was to see people brought in from all over the world to tackle this problem collectively.